Holler.
to the camera and there is audio there <laughs> all right good evening everyone um, VK3 EKH broadcasting on the prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and uh, we aren't doing any simulcasting we still haven't quite got the uh, uh, the other transmitters sorted out for um, uh, for 160 meters at this stage so uh, at the moment it is still uh, basically uh, broadcasting 80 meters and uh, the YouTube channel you can find my YouTube channel on YouTube <laughs> uh, just uh, search for VK3 CSJ and uh, the live symbol and all will be revealed um, okay all right, uh, and we're also got uh, an email address working. So if anybody wishes to send signal reports tonight, uh, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com. We're looking at the inbox as we speak. And we also have a Discord chat window uh, operating too, and that can be found via the ASV website under the Radio Astronomy tab. Um, look for the, the link to the ASV radio broadcast and uh, that's a separate page and you'll see the, uh, the various links to the YouTube and also to um, uh, to the chat window and as I speak I can see Martin VK7 JH is already up there on the chat uh, Uncle Richard is there VK3 VRS uh, and I think maybe Andrew VK3 BQ has a little message he's put up there a little bit earlier in the piece um, and I think that's it for the time being at the moment. All right, uh, um, there's no ATV repeater. Uh, unfortunately, the Melbourne television repeater is still um, uh, in, a, in a, a bit of a state at the moment. So uh, I, um, there's no TV repeater signals and visions happening through that repeater. What was that noise? Some funny noise all of a sudden. Got funny noises around here. I might take the headphones off so I can hear what's going on. <laughs> The Astronomical Society of Victoria, actually I might just do that, hang on, so I'll take these headphones off because they don't really, uh, horrible, it's bad enough that I've got to listen to myself most of the time but having it forced in my ears is another thing, um, yeah, <laughs> the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922, comprises well over 1600 members scattered about uh, the various states of Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy uh, and um, the Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month um, held regularly at the uh, National Herbarium uh, in Melbourne or the Mullio Hall at Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory. Um, meetings start at 8 pm on the noggin with an aim to finish at around 10 o'clock. Um, yep, privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals, and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux. Uh, do I have a copy here? Some, I know I've got a, a new copy, it's just come through of Crux, actually. Yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, which contains articles, news, observing notes and the like, and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Uh, yes, access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after monthly meetings, weather permitting. The instruments located there are a 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor um, maintained by the Royal Botanic Gardens and also a photoheliograph uh, also housed at the observatory and uh, accessible to members as well. The society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan to members uh, before they decide to buy if they wish to buy a telescope. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two, with appropriate training. These range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the site is a 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope with uh, which members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section. 
Members are encouraged to make use in telescopes and advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same thing. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. There are approximately 20 sections that make up the various act activity groups and these are in al alphabetical order. The astronomical, um, astrophotography section, Bendigo section, club section, comet section, computing section, cosmology and astrophysics, deep sky, demonstrator section, diurnals, great Melbourne telescope section, historical section, instrument making, juniors, lunar and planetary, meteor section, new astronomers group, outdoor lightning improvement, radio astronomy, solar and space exploration. The, they are all individual little groups and sections with astrophotography probably being the biggest uh, group in that uh, in that run and uh, if you go to the ASV website at www.asv.org.au look under the sections tab all that that I've just read out uh, are individual pages which give you a bit more further rundown of the various sections uh, and contact details for the section director if you wish to uh, pop in as a visitor um, each section uh, is more than welcome to uh, to uh, host a visit a visitor for a, a night or two or whatever and with the idea of uh, you know if you wish to become a member uh, but um, yeah, if any of those sections sound of value to you uh, by all means uh, get in contact with um, the ASV generally uh, to find out how to uh, how to do it oh all right um, and uh, I've done this a few Fridays in a row now. I'll, I'll probably make this just one more Friday because it's a bit of a list. Uh, the astronomical societies scattered about this, the country. Uh, you've got in Victoria the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society, Mount Burnett Observatory up in the hills there, Ballarat Astronomical, uh, Ballarat astronomical Society, Bendigo District Astronomical Society, which is now merged with the ASV as the Bendigo section. La Trobe Valley Astronomical so Society. I'm off on a good start. The Astronomical Society of Geelong. The Astronomical Society of Aud Albury and Wodonga. I haven't uh, finished my cup of coffee yet. I think that's what it is. And in New South Wales, we have the Western Sydney Amateur Astronomical Group. The Astronomical Society of New South Wales, North Sydney Astronomical Society, the Illawarra, I think that's how you pronounce that, Astronomical Society, the Newcastle Astro Astronomical Society, Sutherland Astronomical Society, they're, they're all based in New South Wales, you know, that other state it's up there. Uh, ACT has of course the Canberra Astronomical Society, Western Australia only seems to have only one society, Astronomical Society of Western Australia for that big, big state. The South Australia has the Astronomical Society of South Australia, of course. Tasmania has the Astro Astronomical Society of Tasmania, Tasmania. And Queensland has the South East Queensland Astronomical Society, Southern Astronomical Society, Brisbane Astronomical Society and the Astronomical Society of Queensland. That's lots of astronomicals. I think I'll give that away now for a few months. But that's it. If you are in those states and are interested in astronomy, I am most certainly sure that any of those societies would take you in. And uh, if you're a newbie to the whole hobby, if you want to call it a hobby, uh, they will certainly show you how to use a telescope, how to look through a telescope, and what, <laughs> what there is to see up there that's of some of any value. And if you're interested in astrophotography, that's the winning ticket. That's what I believe anyway. You are tuned... Oh, there's a bit more information at the end of that list. Um, if you are interested in contacting the ASV, you can do it by a normal mail. Uh, by writing to the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. But uh, otherwise, uh, you can... Um, Go to the, uh, the website, as mentioned before, www.asv.org.au. Um, yes, there's an AU in there. Yep. So, uh, all very good stuff.
G'day Don, g'day Andrew, g'day Ops Power Web. <laughs> I think that's Stuart, yes. G'day guys, thanks for the email there, and uh, good to see the signals seem to be okay on the band tonight. Alright, I'm going to try and finish real early tonight. So that's it, I'll be back next Friday. So I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. No, that's not true. <coughs> Uh, all right, next on the uh, agenda for tonight being this 24th of February. And uh, how was your day? I, I, this is my first week back five days a week. After about 15 months of part-time work where Mondays and Fridays were off and no public holidays being paid. Uh, but this is my first week back at full time five days a week and do you think that's really dragged me out? Anyway, <laughs> I'm pretty tired as a result of that, but we're getting there. Next week should be back to normal really. Uh, okay, this is an interesting little article that's come through on astronomy.com website. Um, how big is this article? I haven't really scanned it. Oh, it should take about half an hour. There's a few images. Actually, there's two, so that'll do. Uh, <clears throat> This is VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone. We just discovered the impossible. Giant young galaxies shake up our understanding of the early universe. And we can owe it to the old James Webb Telescope. James Webb Telescope spotted massive early galaxies that could force scientists to rethink how the first galaxies formed after the Big Bang, February 23rd this year. Now I'll bring up this picture first off on the list so you don't have to look at me all the time. There's audio there. Yep, okay, got to keep a, an eye on that audio. Okay, uh, the story goes like this. Uh, and what you're looking there is real images. Yeah, these are images of six candidate massive galaxies seen 500 million to 800 million years after the Big Bang. Now, I know there's a delay of about 20 seconds between what I'm saying here on live on 80 meters and what you'll see on YouTube. There's not much I can do about that. You're just going to have to live with it. But nevertheless, uh, there are, I've got images up on the screen right now of these five 500 to 800 million year old galaxies from after the Big Bang. Something in that order. The article continues to say that, look at this, says Eric's, Eric's message. Who is Eric, you might ask? Um, is there an Eric in here so far? No. Okay. Look at this, says Eric's message. She is pouring over. She, Eric. It looks like an Eric. Uh, she is pouring over the very first images from a brand new James Webb Space Telescope. It is July 2022, barely a week after those first images from the revolutionary Space Telescope was released. 25 years in the making, 100 to 1000 times more powerful than any previous telescope. One of the biggest and most ambitious scientific instruments in human history. It is hard not to speak in superlatives and it is all true. The telescope took decades to build because it had to be uh, made foldable to fit on the top of a rocket and be sent into the coldness of space, 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Here, far from the heat glow of Earth, JWST can detect the faintest infrared light from the distant universe. Little did I know, says the author, that among the pictures is a small red dot that will shake up our understanding of how the first galaxies formed after the Big Bang. After months of analysis, my colleagues and I, the author, uh, just published our results in Nature, hunting new kinds of galaxies. Erica, oh, maybe that's what it is, Erica and I are on the hunt to discover new types of galaxies, galaxies that uh, the Venerable uh, Hub Space Telescope has missed, or had missed, even after decades of surveying the sky. She and I go back 15 years. We met when she was a first-year student at the Californian Liberal 
Arts College and I was a freshly minded PhD straight out of university, just starting my first gig as a researcher in Los Angeles. JWST was only a distant rumour. Somehow, many years later, our paths crossed again, and now Assistant Professor Erica Nelson of the University of Colorado and I are finding ourselves at the tip of the spear, attacking the first data of a very real James Webb Space Telescope. UFOs, she calls the new galaxies, and I can read a giant, read, read a giant grin between those lines. Ultra red flattened objects, of course, is what that stands for, because they all look like flying saucers. In the color images, they appear very red because all the light is coming out in the infrared, while the galaxies are invisible at wavelengths humans can see. Infrared is JWST's superpower, allowing it to spy the most distant galaxies. Ultraviolet and visible light from the first stars and galaxies that formed after the Big Bang is stretched out by the expansion of the universe as it travels towards us. So by the time the light reaches us, we see it as infrared light. As well, all of, sorry, all of Erica's galaxies look like saucers except one. Uh, she says, I stare at the little red dot on the screen. This is no UFO and then it hits me. This is something very different, much more different, she says. I run with the analysis software on a little pinprick and it, and it spits out two numbers. Distant, distance 13.1 billion light years, mass 100 billion stars, and I nearly spit out my coffee. We just discovered the impossible, uh, impossibly early, impossibly massive galaxies. At this distance, the light took 13 billion years to reach us. So we are seeing the galaxies at a time when the universe was only 700 million years old, barely 5% of its current age of 13.8 billion years. If this is true, this galaxy has formed as many stars as our present day Milky Way in record, record time. And where this there is one, there are more. One day later, I found six, says the author. Could we have discovered astronomy's missing link, they thought. There has been a long-standing puzzle in galaxy formation. As we look out into space and back in time, we see the corpse of fully formed mature galaxies appearing appear seemingly out of nowhere around 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang. These galaxies have stopped forming stars, dead galaxies we call them, and some astronomers are obsessed with them. The stellar ages of these dead galaxies suggest that they must have formed much earlier in the universe, but Hubble has never been able to spot their earlier living stages. Earlier dead galaxies are truly bizarre creatures, packing as many stars as the Milky Way, but in a size 30 times smaller. Imagine an adult weighing 220 pounds or 100 kilograms, but standing 2.4 inches, 6 centimeters tall. Our little red dots are equally bizarre. They look like extremely shrunken versions of normal mass galaxies. There is a problem, however. These little red dots have too many stars, too early. Stars form out of hydrogen gas and fundamental cosmological Big Bang theory makes hard predictions on how much gas is available to form stars. To produce these galaxies so quickly, you almost need all the gases in the universe to turn into stars at nearly 100% efficiency. And this is very hard, which is the scientific term for impossible. This discovery could transform our understanding of how the earliest galaxies in the universe, universe formed. And there's another picture here, uh, which I shall bring up. There it is. All right, now it's a little bit hard to see that one, uh, but let's see. What, what they say here is uh, the six galaxies and their surroundings in the sky. The six galaxies and their surroundings in the sky. Okay. So, carrying on from there, the implication is that there is a there's different channel, a fast track that produces monster galaxies very quickly, very efficiently, 
a fast track for the top 1%. In a way, each of these candidates can be considered a black swan. The confirmation of even one would rule out a current or swan, uh, all swans are white model of galaxy formation in which all early galaxies grow slowly and gradually. So, checking for the fingerprints. The first step to solve this mystery is to confirm the, galaxy, the distances with spectroscopy, where we put the light of each of these galaxies through a prism and split it into the rainbow-like fingerprint. This, is, this, this will tell us the distance to 0.1% accuracy. It will also tell us what is producing the light, whether it is stars or something else more exotic. By chance, about a month ago, James Webb Space Telescope already targeted one of the of six candidate massive galaxies and it turned out to be a distant baby quasar. A quasar is a phenomenon that occurs when gas falls into a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy and starts to shine brightly. This is really exciting on the uh, on one hand because the the, or the origin of supermassive black holes and galaxies is not understood either and finding baby quasars might just hold the key. On the other hand, quasars can outshine their entire host galaxy, so it is, it is impossible to tell how many stars are there and whether the galaxy is really that massive. Could that be the answer for all of them? Question mark. Baby quasars are everywhere? Question mark. Well, probably not, but it will take another year to investigate the remaining galaxies to find out. One black swan down, five to go. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astrophysics of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Marriott Warren South. And the time is 24 past the hour. Ugh. Coffee, coffee, coffee. Now this is an interesting one. This is this definitely does require you to look at YouTube, okay? Um, because this image you're about to see is rather startling. I thought it was. <laughs> so I'm going to wait 20 seconds for things to catch up. One, two, three. No, I won't do that. Um, all right. Now this this is courtesy of Science Alert www.sciencealert.com Thank you, Science Alert. The article is titled The White Specks in this image aren't stars or galaxies. Oh, better bring, bring up the image. All right. Here's the image. Where's the image? There it is. bother you. Now do I repeat all that? <laughs> uh, dear. Uh, let's see. Back to the article. <coughs> all right. Back. Sorry about that. I'm sorry about the audio disappearing for a sec on YouTube. Maybe the 20 seconds is uh, made up for it. Anyway, um, I'll just say that again. That this is only a paragraph. Yep. Uh, the image above, or the image on YouTube, um, may look like a fairly normal picture of the night sky, but what you're looking at is a lot more special than just glittering stars. Each of those white dots is an active supermassive black hole, and each of those black holes is devouring material at the heart of the galaxy millions of light years away. That's how they could be pinpointed at all. Alright, we'll pass that. Released in 2021, this image contains 25,000 such dots. 
It's the most detailed map to date of black holes at low radio frequencies. This grabs my interest straight away. Um, an achievement that took years and a Europe-sized radio telescope to compile. This is the result of many years of work on incredible, incredibly difficult data, explained astronomer Francisco de Gasperin of the University of Hamburg in Germany back in February 2021. We had to invent new methods to convert radio signals into images of the sky. And here's another image here too to bring up. I'll make sure there's still audio there when I do this. Oh yes, look, there's audio there. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, we had to invent new methods to convert radio signals into images of the sky. And there it is. Um, okay. When they are just hanging out, not doing much, black holes don't give off any detectable radiation, making them much harder to find. When a black hole is actively accreting material, spooling it in from a disk of dust and gas that circles it much as water circles a drain, the intense forces involved generate radiation across multiple wavelengths that can be detected across vastness of space. What makes the above, or the images that you're seeing on the screen right now, what makes the image so special is that it covers the ultra-low radio wavelengths as detected by the LOW, Low Frequency Array, or LOFAR, in Europe. This interferometer network consists of around 20,000 radio antennas distributed throughout 52 locations across Europe. Currently, LOFAR is the only radio telescope network capable of deep, high-resolution images or imaging at frequencies below 100 megahertz, offering a view of the sky like no other. This data release covering 4% of the northern sky was the first of the network's ambitious plan to image the entire northern sky in ultra-low frequencies, the LOFAR LBA Sky Survey, or LOLSS. Because it's based on Earth, LOFAR does have a significant hurdle to overcome, and that doesn't afflict and that doesn't afflict space-based telescopes, the ionosphere. This is particularly problematic for low-frequency radio waves, which can be reflected back into space. At frequencies below five megahertz, the ionosphere is opaque for this reason. The frequencies that do penetrate the ionosphere can vary according to atmospheric conditions. To overcome this problem, the team used supercomputers running algorithms to correct for ionospheric interference every four seconds. Over the 256 hours that LOFAR started stared, stared at the sky, that's a lot of corrections. This is what was given us, well, this is what's given us such a clear view of the ultra low frequency sky. As many years of software development, it is so wonderful to see that this, how this has really worked out, said astronomer Hugh Rottengung of Leiden Observatory in the Netherlands. And the results were published in Astronomy Astrophysics. Uh, interesting that all those little uh, dots you see there on the screen are uh, the results of black holes. It's a rather remarkable thing. Yes, anyway, there it is. You're tuned to VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Time is 29 minutes to 11. No worries, Kim. Uh, okay, next article. Next article, which I think is a bit of a, another theme in black holes. Um, yes, yes, this is not a very big article. Oh no, it's huge actually. Oh, that will do. Um, there's a few pictures in it, but yeah. <laughs> All right, continuing on with the black hole theme. Um, but this is interesting too. In fact, it is actually quite interesting. It's all very interesting stuff. Uh, let me bring up the image here. And
sorry about that back to the audio again got to keep tabs of that uh, so what you're seeing here is an is a an, 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 an illustration showing a black hole being ejected from a galaxy's center at a as a trail of brightly glowing gas follows behind Astronomers have spotted a runaway supermassive black hole seemingly ejected from its home galaxy and racing through space with a chain of stars trailing in its wake. According to the team's research, which, which was published on the preprint server arxiv.org uh, and has been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, the discovery offers the first observational evidence that supermassive black holes can be ejected from their home galaxies to roam interstellar space. That's a bit interesting. The researchers undiscovered, sorry, <laughs> the researchers discovered the runaway black hole as a bright streak of light uh, while they were using the Hubble Space Telescope to observe a dwarf galaxy, RCP28, located about 7.5 billion light years from Earth. Follow-up observations show that the streak measures more than 200,000 light years long, roughly twice the width of the Milky Way, and this is thought to be made of compressed gas that is actively forming stars. The gas trails a black hole that is estimated to measure 20 million times the mass of the Sun and is speeding away from its home galaxy at 5.6 million kilometers an hour, or roughly 4,500 times that of the speed of sound. According to the researchers, the streak points right to the center of a galaxy where a supermassive black hole would normally sit. We found a thin line in a Hubble image that is pointing to the center of a galaxy lead study author Peter van Dockum, a professor of physics and at the astronomy of Yale University told Live Science. Using the Keck telescope in Hawaii, we found that the line and the galaxy are connected. From a detailed analysis of the feature, we inferred that we are seeing a very massive black hole that was ejected from the galaxy, leaving a trail of gas and newly formed stars in its wake. Now I'll bring up the next image which shows this uh, a bit more interestingly. Uh, where is it? There it is. And sound is still there. <laughs> Okay, the team concluded, oh, sorry, where are we? Um, that was the next paragraph uh, in its wake. Now, confirming the trail of an ejected black hole. Most, if not all, large galaxies host supermassive black holes at their centers. Massive supermassive black holes often launch jets of material at high speeds, which can be seen as streaks of light that superficially resemble the one the researchers spotted and these are called astrophysical jets and you can see in the image there you can just make that on the right side there's that uh, image of the jet that it's talking about uh, to determine uh, this isn't what they observed van dockham and his team investigated the streak and found it didn't possess any of the telltale signs of an astrophysical jet while astrophysical jets grow weaker as they move away from their source of emission the potential supermassive black hole tail actually gets stronger as it progresses away from what seems to be its galactic point of origin, according to the researchers. Also, astrophysical jets launched by black holes fan out from the, their source, whereas this tail seems to have remained linear. The team concluded that the explanation that best fits the streak is a supermassive black hole blasting through the gas that surrounds its galaxy while compressing that gas enough to trigger star formation in its wake. If confirmed, it would be the first time that we have clear evidence that supermassive black holes can escape from galaxies. Once the runaway supermassive black hole is confirmed, the next question that astronomers need to answer is how much or how such a, a monstrous, monstrous object gets ejected from its host galaxy. The most likely scenario that explains everything we've seen is a slingshot caused by three body interaction, von, von van Dockham said. When three simil similar mass bodies gravitationally interact, the interaction 
does not lead to a stable configuration but usually to the formation of a binary and ejection of the third body. This might mean that the runaway black hole was once part of a rare supermassive black hole binary and include and during a galactic merger a third supermassive black hole was introduced to its partnership flinging out one of its occupants. My goodness. Astronomers aren't sure how common this, these massive runaways are. Ejected supermassive black holes had been predicted for 50 years but none have, act, none have been um, ambiguously seen, Van Dockham said. Most theorists think that there should be many out there Further observations with other telescopes are needed to find direct evidence of black holes at the mysterious streak tip, Van Dockham said. Right, there it is. That's another article. <laughs> black holes. Um, yeah, so that's courtesy of uh, Science Alert. Sorry, space.com uh, for that one. Runaway black hole at the size of 20 million suns found speeding through space with a tail of newborn stars behind it. And you can actually see that in that image I've got on the screen right now. You, you can basically see the newborn stars in its tail. It, if only we could just trip out there for a, a couple of hours to get real close-up shots of all this stuff. It would be so cool. Anyway, um, back to uh, you're tuned to VK3EKH official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Oh, g'day Ian, he sent me an email. Um, next. We are here. Oh, okay, this could be interesting. This should be interesting. A little bit of a, a divergence. The moon. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Um, a moon mystery at Woods Flash. When the sun shines over the landscape at just the right angle, the lunar surface comes alive. February 22, 2023, astronomy.com. <laughs> I'll bring up this image. Uh, where are we? This one here. This and this one here. <laughs> Back again with the audio. All right. Oh, don't, don't get me to, to pronounce that word. Please don't. Um, all right. The dynamic interplay of light and shadow across the lunar surface is a perpetual source of visual wonder and sometimes puzzlement. Nearly 40 years ago, Terry Atwood of Sherebaport, Louisiana, saw one such display in the crater Hypatia. The feature lies in a tiny uh, promontory of equatorial lunar highland just south of the Apollo 11 landing site in Mar Tranquilitas, Sea of Tranquility, it's easy to say. The crater's name honours Hypatia of Egypt, uh, AD 370-415 AD, the first woman known to have made a substantial contribution to the development of mathematics. Under the right geometry, a ray of sunlight can slice across Hypatia's otherwise shadowed crater floor. Such an event is likely best seen around a solar longitude of 350 degrees, or about 10 degrees shy of first quarter. With the sun about 13 degrees high in the lunar sky, as seen from Hypatia. In that case, the events are likely to next occur on February 27 at around 1.26 UT and around April 27 at 3 hours 30 minutes UT if you're keen to look out for that. But on January 16, 1986, Atwood saw a phenomenon which may be a visual prelude to the well-known ray. He was using his 8-inch cave Astrola reflector to search for the tiny craters named after the Apollo 11 astronauts when, at 1 hour 13 minutes UT, he saw two rays of light suddenly flash into view in Hypatia. The view was akin to being in a dark room when a door suddenly opens a crack, allowing a light to stream in. 
the light flashed on, Ashwood, Ashwood says, says, and stayed on. <laughs> at the time of Atwood's sighting, the moon was five and a half days after new at the Kolong Kolong altitude 333 degrees. That's a new word for me. Kolong Kolong altitude Kolong altitude. I'll have to look that one up. Well, before the expected ray should appear on the crater's irregular floor, indeed Atwood's friend Roy Parrish, former coordinator of the lunar section of the Astro of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, determined <coughs> that Ashwood's Atwood's flash took place when the sun was about 3.5 degrees below the lunar surface. <coughs> Sorry, I'm about to cough here and make a horrible noise. Ugh, clear my throat. <laughs> Let's start again. So, uh, determined that Atwood's flash took place when the sun was about 3.5 degrees below the lunar horizon, as seen from the centre of Hypatia's floor. However, Parrish notes that the sun's attitude altitude would only have to be about one degree high to illuminate the hilltops north of the crater's floor. The crater also or has actually no central peak. Now just before I carry on there's a little picture here of Hypatia's apparently um, which I did have I saved and bring that up there it is. Oh, I had that image up a lot so I didn't know that. Um, okay so here we have Hy Hypatia's life and murderer sorry Hy Hy Hypatia's life and murder has been the subject of many works of literature, theatre and film. This 1890s woodcut portrait shows British actress Julie Nelson in the character of Hypatia. Okay, now I understand. Okay, so it's actually uh, a, a, an 1890s woodcut portrait of British actress Julia Nielsen um, in the character of Hypatia. Okay, well that's just for information's sake there. All right, there's one more picture here. <laughs> so, Atwood's sighting then just may be the earliest known record of the first glints of sunlight slipping through a gap in Hypatia's eastern wall on its way to start the ray. It's possible that atmospheric seeing may have produced distortions that magnified the apparent flash. So, in this picture that you can see on the screen right now, the breach in Hypatia's eastern wall and ray-like streaks in the crater's western wall are visible in this Apollo 16 image, if you know what you're looking at. The fresh circular crater is lower left at Hypatia A, north is up and east is to the right. You have to know a little bit about the moon, I think, to understand this article. But why then did Atwood's seize two rays? Here is the hypothesis. The United States Geological Survey Geologic Atlas of the Moon shows that Hypatia's walls, Hypatia's walls have a high albedo, meaning that they are highly reflective, suggesting the presence of freshly exposed volcanic material. Furthermore, in a, a, an image of the crater taken by Apollo 16's mapping camera shows several upright bright streaks on the crater's western wall just opposite the breach. The higher the elevation of these bright streaks might explain Atwood's dual ray phenomenon and why it appeared as such a low sun angle. It is possible under the right viewing geometry for sunlight to glint off structures of volcanic glass within the streaks as the sun nears rising, creating a striking prelude to the Hypatia ray. More observations are needed to solve this mystery. Hmm. As Atwood says, I, remi I, remember, I remember a professor saying that the faintest note is worth the fondest memory. Atwood's words recall those of Hypatia's father, also a renowned mathematician, who is said to have told her, reserve your right to think, or even to think wrongly is better than not to think at all. As always, send your thoughts. Oh, don't worry about that. Um, so, yeah, there it is. That, that article is from astronomy.com. Uh, a moon's mystery, Atwood's flash. There it is. It's wild, it's news to me, all that. So, there it is. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3, EKH. And this last article, before we go into the spaceweather.com. Uh, just go back to the picture, uh, to the camera for a sec. Ah, uh, no. 
on, on, on. Here we are, back to me. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narrywarren South. Uh, okay, also from astronomy.com, we still can't protect Earth from potentially hazardous asteroids. <clears throat> so in this image you're seeing here on camera, well not on camera, but since I find it in the YouTube thing, there it is. Right now this is just an illustration of course, it's not a real image of an asteroid <laughs> near Earth. Um, anyway, um, NASA is working hard to identify and track asteroids that pose the greatest danger to Earth, but despite a con congressional mandate, the agency is falling short. Uh, last year, NASA's DART mission, D-A-R-T, DART mission made headlines after it successfully smashed into the side of Demimorphos the small orbiting companion of a larger asteroid named Didymos. That planned impact measurable changed a measurable that planned impact measurable changed the orbit of Demimorphos, heralding a new chapter in humanity's ability to defend itself from cosmic threats. Once more problem, we have very little idea of what those threats are and where they might come from. Thankfully, NASA is hoping to change that. So you might ask, how many near-Earth asteroids are there? I hear you say. To put it mildly, rogue asteroids pose a major threat to our survival here on Earth. The largest asteroids, those larger than a kilometre across, are capable of triggering extinction level, of, uh, 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 level events on Earth. However, Large asteroids are relatively rare, striking Earth only every half million years or so. What's more, concerning are the smaller, much more numerous asteroids that are less than one kilometre across. While those won't destroy a civilization, they could still take out a major city or two or trigger global spanning tsunami waves. In 2005, the US Congress decided that NASA should up its asteroid detection game. Congress mandated that NASA identify, track and characterize 90% of near-Earth objects, NEOs, with a diameter greater than 560 feet or 140 meters. That's so large that a truly catastrophic things could happen should such an asteroid strike Earth. There was a deadline for the mandate to uh, NASA was to uh, direct to accomplish the NEO detection effort before or by 2020. One catch, however, despite the clear directive, Congress didn't authorise any additional funding for NASA to actually accomplish it. NASA pushes for planetary defence. As the 2020 deadline loomed, the clever flokes, flokes, flokes at NASA got creative Instead of relying only on ground-based surveys, uh, which were slow and difficult to fund, they prioritised new spaceflight missions, helping them to sell the concept of planetary defence to Congress. And it worked. Congress approved the funding of DART a year before NASA even formally proposed it. Along with DART also came a repurp repurposing of the defunct WISE spacecraft which had been sitting dormant in orbit for nearly for, for several years now called neo wise for near earth object wide field infrared survey explorer the rebranded instrument re rebranded instrument is now nasa's go to facility for finding potential threats to earth and this next image is rather startling uh, it's a gift image GIF image, and we'll bring that up. There it is, and I'm still there. Look at that. Um, okay. So what you're seeing there on YouTube screen right now, <coughs> this am animation shows the changing positions of known near-Earth asteroids or objects near NEOs over the past 20 years. The map includes all known asteroids found as of January 2018. 
So even though it's a, a animation, it's actually a real uh, image on the scale that we're looking at uh, of how busy our space here in the solar system is. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, asteroids or near-Earth objects up there to be worried about and keeping track of. So, At the last count, as of the writing of this article, NEOWISE and other ground-based telescopes have identified 859 NEOs larger than one kilometer across. 10,398 NEOs larger than 560 feet or 140 meters across and 31,247 NEOs of all sizes. In total, that accounts for roughly 35% of all the estimated NEOs out there and although uh, valuable that number still falls far short of the congressional mandate to identify 90% of NEOs. So plenty more hazardous asteroids left to find. In response NASA is rushing forward with new programs and partnerships. For instance the Legacy Survey of Space and Time LSST of the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory should be able to locate 90% of all NEOs greater than 300 meters across. Meanwhile, the successor of NEOWISE, currently called NEO Surveyor, was rushed through the funding approval process outside of the usual competitive proposal channels. NEO Surveyor is now planned to launch in 2028 and its mission will be to complete the Congressional mandated, mandated NEO census. And there's one more image here uh, of a uh, telescope structure. Uh, there it is. Bring it up. So this is an artist's concept that shows the completed Vera C. Rubin Observatory will look like a top El Penon summit in Chile. Big building. But these instruments will identif identify and track potentially hazardous asteroids, they will still fall short in one key area, characterization. It's one thing to identify a smudge of bright pixels as an asteroid and follow its motion for a few weeks to estimate its orbit, which is something future observatories will do with ease. However, it is a completely different thing to closely study the asteroid to determine its shape, surface features and composition. Knowing these characteristics is essential to accurately assessing the danger of an asteroid and the danger doesn't just come from a potential intersection of orbits based on initial observations of the asteroid. The detailed shape and brightness of an asteroid can radically change its initial predicted orbit due to the uneven heating from the Sun. In other words, without NEO characterization, we really don't get a full picture of what kind of threat an asteroid might pose to Earth. So what characterizing asteroids can teach us? If an asteroid does present itself as a threat to our planet, the first thing we'll want to know is the asteroid's composition. Many asteroids are rubble piles with small bits of rocks only loosely held together by their own gravity. These rubble pile asteroids are particularly hard to destroy as they act like giant space cushions uh, when something strikes them. Uh, other asteroids are rich in metals and are incredibly dense. A DART-like mission to save Earth from an asteroid strike would very greatly depend on whether the object was a rubble or pile, a rubble pile or a dense metal-rich object. An asteroid's composition also plays an important role in what happens what would happen should the asteroid strike Earth. It might just break apart in our atmosphere or it could bury itself deep in the Earth's crust. Many astronomers have floated proposals to help get better handle on NEO compositions. One such proposal is for an array of small satellites flying in a constellation in low Earth orbit, each equipped with visible and infrared sensors to continuously monitor newly identified NEOs and develop models of their surface compositions and structures. However, it will take several more years of upcoming NEO ob observatories to come online and complete these surveys. So in the meantime, keep your fingers crossed. 
You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. No broadcast. Now to spaceweather.com. Take it away, Jane. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right. Oh, um, just a little advert for Mount Burnett. Uh, it's just because it came up next. Uh, where's my slide? There it is. Bring the audio back on. There we are. All right. Now, for those guys uh, that are local in the hills, um, okay, Mount Burnett Observatory is uh, available for a visit uh, most Friday nights. I suspect they would be up there right now as we speak. Um, more information about the Mount Burnett Observatory or MBU. Uh, can be found on the uh, website, of course, at uh, mbo.org.au, www.mbo.org.au if you want to find out more information. According to the website here, it looks like they're, got a, uh, they're going to be set up at the Avalon 2023 Australian International Air Show, Aerospace and Defence Exposition, 28th of February to the 5th of March, Avalon Airport, Geelong, Victoria. So they've got a table set up. Uh, they say here we are exhibiting, see us at stand 2G19, 2G19 at the Avalon 2023 Australian International Air Show. So that's a bit of a plug for MBO, um, but there it is. Uh, you can find that out more information by visiting the website, the good old uh, observatory up there. Um, yes, okay. Spaceweather.com. The solar wind is currently at 491 point oh hang on let me change images uh go back to me here we are got to remember to do that um spaceweather.com the solar wind is at speed 491.2 kilometers a second at a density of 10.87 protons per cubic centimeter there are one two three four five sunspots on the disk of the sun as we speak and uh, I've got that image there too. So yes, there it is. Um, not uh, not so busy, but it's uh, there's a few interesting sunspots there. Um, and uh, there's an incoming solar wind stream. Uh, a stream of solar wind is approaching Earth ETA February 26 to 27. The gaseous material is flowing from a, an equatorial hole in the sun's atmosphere, and I do have a picture of that too. Uh, there it is. Okay, there's the hole that they're all worried about. Um, the gaseous material is flowing from an equatorial hole in the sun's atmosphere, and it could spark a minor G1 class geomagnetic storm when it arrives. Uh, the current sunspot number is 108 and the radio sun measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters which I think is 2.8 gigs something around about there the radio sun the current uh, uh, rate is 200 sorry 148 solar flux units 148 solar flux units is the current radio sun and I can bring up another image there which shows you our solar cycle so this still stands um, that's our solar cycle there so where that yellow arrow is is approximately where we are on the cycle and we are reaching that uh, that nine year peak as previous cycle 24 so things are still getting quite active as you can see um, okay and uh, cosmic rays uh, on cycle 25 is intensifying uh, and is reflected in the number of cosmic rays entering Earth's atmosphere. Neutron counts from the University of uh, someplace geophysical observatory show that cosmic rays, rays reaching Earth are slowly declining as a result of the yin yang relationship between the solar cycle and the cosmic rays. I think I had an image here, yeah, there we are this is the cosmic ray map so for those looking at the, at the YouTube you can see how uh, cosmic ray radiation increases during solar minima but as we come into the solar maxima uh, the solar the cosmic ray radiation uh, decreases 
as a result of increase in solar radiation and that chart you're seeing on the screen there reflects that there's also a little balloon thing there which carries the detector high up in the atmosphere which then shortly after will be shot down uh, <laughs> Okay, carrying on a bit more, uh, we have the, there's not much of uh, auroral activity, although we had some, uh, apparently we had some very good uh, auroral activity um, seen this early this week. Again, once again, I, I missed from seeing any of that, uh, but the Aurora uh, Australis uh, was visible from Perth, South Australia, Victoria, no doubt Tasmania, and Queensland too, I believe. Uh, so that was rather startling. If I had, had any idea, um, I would have been out somewhere trying to look at it. Um, but uh, the, the current uh, uh, auroral oval over, over Antarctica is quite uh, small at the moment. I've got that up on the screen too. So there's not, not a whole lot of auroral activity happening right now as we speak. It's a very faint green glow. So it's uh, very quiet on the home front. The planetary K index, Kp is currently 2, 2.00, which is considered quiet. The 24-hour max Kp figure is up to 4.00 and, and considered unsettled, but it's hovering around 2 at the moment. On that, potentially hazardous asteroids, which are space rocks larger than 100 metres, but none of the known PHAs are on a collision course with our planet at the moment but as of February 24 2023 there are 2,331 potentially hazardous asteroids all good fun so I think that's about it for this evening I think we've covered, covered everything that I had there it's amazing how it still went over time anyway all right uh, thank you very much, Lee, for listening. Um, more information about the uh, Astronomical Society of Victoria, which is broadcasters on behalf of, and of course VK3 EKH is the official call sign, belongs to the Society, uh, can be found on the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. We have been broadcasting on this frequency since 1988, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to be here for another heaven knows how much longer but anyway hopefully next week we'll have the ATV repeater working for us uh, Melbourne television repeater VK3 RTV full HD and um, uh, no guarantee about our 160 meter transmissions but we're working on that too this is VK3 EKH to everybody who's been up on the chat window there tonight uh, Kim VK5 FUSE Martin VK7 JAH uh, and I know Richard's there somewhere VK3VRS, who often speaks behind me through a wireless set. Steve, VK3SPX, and I think that's about all I can see. Uh, Mitch, VK3ZT, is also there. Um, and I think that's about it. And Andrew, VK3BQ, uh, also uh, popped in a message about NASA looking for ham radio assistance. Now, I think it's predominantly a northern hemisphere thing uh, but ham radio operators we're calling you members of the ham radio science citizen investigation will be making radio contacts during the 2023 and 2024 northern American eclipses probing the earth's atmosphere it will be a fun friendly event uh, with a competitive element uh, so it's a pretty much the northern hemisphere thing but there it is there uh, uh, NASA are seeking help from the amateur fraternity which is uh, good to see thanks to uh, Andrew for that uh, it looks like Kieran's there well, that's last week okay <laughs> uh, dear. all right thanks guys for your chatter on the uh, uh, discord uh, chat window and to all the folks that sent me emails there uh, Stuart Andrew Don Stephen and Ian uh, thank you very much, Lee. I'll read those emails out when uh, I'm finished here. You've been tuned to VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, coming to you from the broadcasting studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren. 
Thank you for watching tonight and listening, and we'll be back next Friday to do it all again, hopefully with some more interesting articles and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I'll get my pen ready, and if there's anybody out there wishing to uh, uh, come in for a quick uh, hello and goodbye, uh, <laughs> by all means do so. This is VK3 EKH. Oops, take the headphones out. Uh, this is VK3 EKH. Oops. Oh, that's all right. Sorry. Did not bother you. VK3 EKH listing on 3541 for anybody who wants to check in. VK3 Juliet Romeo. Uh, VK3 Tango Juliet Chef. VK7 Juliet Alpha Hotel. VK3 SPX. Okay, we've got VK3JR, VK3TJS, VK7JH, and VK3SBX. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> Take it away, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. VK3EKH, VK3JR, thank you, Quint. And good evening, everyone. Uh, VK3JR, standard as usual. Broadcast. Good on you, Frank. VK3 JR, VK3 EKH. Is um, Steve going to be up on uh, 160 later tonight? I'm so. I'm being I'm pretty sure he is. Okay, I'll take a listen. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Frank. <coughs> oh, my voice is losing it. Uh, thanks, Frank. VK3 TJS, uh, Jack up at Chipperton. How are you? No worries, Jack. VK3 TJS, VK3 CSJ, uh, EKH. You're a very good signal here tonight. Uh, constant uh, 20 over 9. A little bit of uh, interesting QSB there. If uh, uh, if it wasn't for a um, virtually non-existent uh, Aurora activity, I, I would almost say that it's, uh, it has that uh, uh, Aurora sound to it. Pardon me, but um, anyway, it's um, a good signal. 20 over. Not a problem. Thanks, uh, Jack, um, and uh, likewise, also have a, a good weekend. It's a, it's a normal two-day weekend for me. I had, haven't had a two-day weekend for a, quite a while, so maximum uh, effort to uh, do everything tomorrow. <laughs> um, all right, thanks, Jack. Um, Martin, VK7JAH, good signal from you too, VK3EKH. Thank you, Chris. Uh, excellent signal for you, for me, I'm going to 
No worries, Martin, VK7JH, VK3EKH. That, that must have been an amazing sight um, to, to have the uh, aurora so bright that it, uh, it was able to uh, you know, like come into the house through the windows. I mean, that's just, uh, that's just stunning. Um, I, I recently saw some YouTube footage, video footage, fairly current video footage uh, of uh, real-time aurora. Normally, you, the, the, the auroras that I've seen are either still images or what look like uh, sped up video um, so that you can really, so you can dramatically see the, the, the changes in the, in the atmosphere, uh, the curtain-like effects uh, that you see with the aurora. But this particular footage I saw just uh, uh, about a week ago um, was in real time. They hadn't sped up the video. Um, you, you could see people walking around in, in the foreground of where this camera was and uh, it, was, it was normal speed and this, yeah, this auroral activity was, was just uh, amazing to see it was uh, just stunning and I thought my god it's, it's, uh, it's so uh, alive <laughs> just think of that science fiction film um, anyway, um, but yeah, uh, one day I'll see. One day I'll get out there as soon as I get my observatory um, built up in the backyard here and telescopes all set up. I'll uh, I'll try to be in a position to uh, to see it when it's um, when there's a particular activity. I suspect that with the uh, Solar 25 uh, cycle 25 coming up, uh, there's there's definitely going to be uh, uh, some some more uh, of a, a rural activity happening so maybe this is the time that I'll finally get to see some of this stuff anyway that's another story thanks Martin good signal from you and uh, thanks for coming up uh, Steve VK3 SBX VK3 EKH VK3 VIN when you're ready please no worries uh, VK3 EKH this is VK3 
Yeah. So I'm looking forward to the continuation of that series. A lot of people didn't really take to Star Trek Discovery and admittedly I didn't either. Uh, I saw the first couple of episodes and was thought, ah, I'll give it a miss. But we binge watched the first four seasons and uh, then that's when I, I kind of enjoyed it. So um, I certainly like my binge watching. All right, um, across to you there, Ian, VK3VIN, VK3EKH, over, over. In your end, VK3 VIN Kangaroo Flat VK3 CSEKH. Uh, <laughs> yes, look, I, I look, I, I know where you're coming from, and uh, I know where you're going. <laughs> um, that's a little quote quotation from uh, Neil Diamond's The Jazz Singer. Of course, you have to be a Neil Diamond fan to understand that. Um, sorry, <laughs> uh, but I, I know where you're going, and uh, I, I think. I think it's all very safe um, uh, in that the, uh, the, there's there's just going to be uh, so much of the universe that will basically be re re will remain um, unknown or no no firm answers. I mean, science is doing a, a, a really good job at determining a lot of things that are going on at very vast re remote distance places. Um, our ability to uh, to look back into time and to be able to analyze the the data through light and through radio light uh, and uh, and use uh, supercomputers to to analyze the data and simulate uh, the uh, what uh, what's going on out there is uh, helping us to complete the picture um, you know, falling short of, uh, of actually being able to fly or go to these places which you, as we know in, in our lifetime maybe in, 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 in all of the remaining years that the human species is here uh, we'll, we'll never be able to journey to the stars it, it may just not be possible at all um, sure there'll be technological advances with this, uh, there's uh, a lot of things still to, to come through that we, we don't know of yet but um, 
you know, falling short of a, uh, of a, of a Star Trek type universe. <laughs> Uh, we're pretty much homebound on this uh, planet, so the best thing we can do is just send probes to distant worlds and uh, and use our extend our sensors via uh, robotic means, and of course using our intelligence. These are astrophysicists are smart people, so uh, what uh, what they're finding out about the universe is is really quite amazing. So. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm here to report it every Friday night, so <laughs> as best as I can anyway. Um, yeah. All right, thanks Ian. Appreciate uh, uh, coming in and uh, you're also hovering around 20 over 9 too. Good signal from you tonight as well. The, the short skip is working very well tonight. Cheers to everybody that's on the uh, chat window there. I think I've been through that list already. Uh, Kim, BK5, FUSE, Richard, Kim, Martin, Kim, 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 Mitch. <laughs> They're all chatting there. Anyway, cheers everyone. Take care. Have a, a pleasant weekend. Uh, there's a cold front uh, that's coming through um, across Victoria tomorrow. So there will be a, a few thunderstorm activities going on. A little bit of rain falling here and falling there. Uh, but at least it'll be a cooler day. Uh, I think for the next four or five days it's going to be uh, below, in the 20s at least. So, um, yeah. But um, we've had some hot days, but not many. So it's been a relatively mild summer. This is VK3, EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone, concluding transmissions for tonight. And we'll be back next Friday, 10 o'clock, to do it all again. Take care, everybody. Look after yourselves. VK3, EKH clear on 3541. And to everybody on my YouTube channel that's uh, watching me there, thanks for watching me. <laughs> we'll uh, be back again. Uh, I know there's a few people that like to catch up with this uh, this YouTube through uh, through the week, so I appreciate the uh, the folks that do uh, uh, catch up with it if they don't catch up with it now. So it's all makes it all worthwhile. And uh, again, we'll um, see you all next week. Um, yeah. So cheers for now, look after yourselves and take care. This is ASV Radio, signing off.